Eh, perdón, eh, la, al empezar va, va a hablar Nicole y, In the beginning, y Verónica Nicole o parto directo. Going to speak and Veronica, or should I start? Ah, yeah. You can start. Ah, okay. And then you can switch to us. Vale. We'll Entonces parto yo, después habla cada so start, ONG y después. And then each NGO will speak. Ajá. Okay. So we're live. Bueno, eh, comenzamos. So let's begin. Bueno, eh, buenos días, eh, buenas good tardes morning. y buenas noches. Good afternoon and good evening. Quienes están presentes eh, en este webinar. A nombre de Fundación Tantí y del Observatorio Internacional de Sanidad de Sandino Sosal, le doy la bienvenida y agradezco el esfuerzo que están haciendo para estar presentes acá en este evento. Esta mesa redonda y la presentación del libro y del documental titulado de Sandino ha sido posible gracias a una inmensa red de solidaridad y apoyo de organizaciones como Fundación Tantí, Fundación Jain Ritual, Global Dream, y el equipo que estuvo compuesto por Bárbara Jerez, Sergio Uribe, Verónica Costiza, Nico Vivanco, Wendy. Gwendolyn Ledier y Catherine Calderón. Pero también eh, al trabajo que muchas veces en silencio realizan quienes habitan y defienden los salares andinos. Que nos acompañan hoy día. También estamos hoy día con la participación de Earthworks, Canada Mining Watch y FAN de Argentina, a quienes le agradecemos por el apoyo y la colaboración en este y tantos otros espacios de colaboración. Y concientización sobre los impactos de la minería asociada a la transición energética. La Sabemos que el crecimiento verde como paradigma dominante de la transición energética corporativa es sinónimo de más extractivismo en nuestros territorios y que el extractivismo, por muy verde que se viera, se que ya tienen cinco and, siglos de, de existencia en nuestra América. And we por ello es que en plena crisis sanitaria, sure climática, política, económica, hemos decidido salir adelante area, con esta iniciativa y crear este espacio de la Mesa Redonda Plurinacional para ampliar las voces locales y situarlas en las demandas globales de justicia climática, aportando la construcción de alternativas profundas en trabajo y reflexión. Bienvenidos, bienvenidas y muchas gracias. Se da la palabra a las organizaciones que nos están acompañando. Dale. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm Gloria Leo, coordinator of the socio-ecological transition in the Cone, uh, Southern Cone office that covers Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay. The foundation has worked together with Opsal in many activities, especially in this past year, including the publication of the documentary that's being presented here today. And we hope this collaboration continues in the future. Our long-term vision is to generate a deep, profound change that include new perspectives for technologies and de-emphasizes lithium as a true solution. Because of the extractivism, we're experiencing severe ecological crisis. And this has been a difficult year, but at the same time, it's a very unique opportunity to make profound change. The world hasn't always been ruled by the laws that we see today. And we have an opportunity to leave behind this habit of destructing the environment in order to grow. I'm eager to hear the many experiences of my colleagues participating today. And you've been doing really extraordinary work to raise awareness. And thank you very much, Ramon, for helping us put it together. Good afternoon. Before we continue, 
speaking, I want to remind you that you have access to interpretation if you desire. You click on the globe at the bottom that says interpretation on the bottom of your screen. And it's at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can click on it and select English for interpretation. Bueno, muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Benjamin. Good afternoon. My name is Benjamin. And I form part of an NGO called Earthworks, with headquartered in the United States. This NGO has been working for over three decades, helping communities that have been affected by mining and petroleum and gas extraction in the United States and many other countries. My specific role is to monitor the impact of um, the impact of extractivism in the case of metals that are used for the battery industry. And I had the pleasure of making contact and getting to know Opsal a little over a year ago. And I've been so inspired by your collective efforts and the way you've elevated the voices of so many of these affected communities. And it's truly a pleasure to form a small part of this very important event. Thank you. And I'll give the floor now to Kirsten. Pues muchas gracias, Benjamin. Gracias, Ramon. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, Ramon. Thank you to the Upsal eh, team for your eh, coordination sí, mi es efforts. Kirsten My name is Kirsten Francisconi. I'm the Latin, Latin American Latin coordinator for Mining Watch Canada. It's a Canadian, Canadian NGO and has been working for uh, 20 years por with communities that have been affected uh, pues by mining operations. Estamos aquí porque pensamos que el trabajo We're here que está because Cabo, pues, eh, Opsal y las, las demás organizaciones que están aquí en esa llamada es muy importante, como dijo Benjamín, un poco para, sirve como espacio para juntar a, a comunidades de varios lugares, como ya, ya se ve en el, en el programa un poco para que nosotros en el norte podemos entender eh, cuáles son los impactos ¿no? de, de ese llamado transición well. energética. Canada de tratar de, eh, bueno, un momento de especulación sobre también eh, ligado a la, a la transición energética um, por, por minerales como grafito, litio, que están ligados pues a la, a, sobre todo a la cuestión de baterías, ¿no? Y hemos visto de primera mano cuáles, cuáles han sido los impactos de esas industrias sobre las comunidades eh, que viven pues muy cercanas a donde se pretende abrir esas minas, ¿no? Entonces es, es una preocupación en temática, es muy importante y es un muy lindo espacio. Very important. And we thank you for uh, allowing us to share this space with you today. Pia, quieres comentar algo antes de Pia, would you like to say something? Solo, solo una cosa técnica, Ramón. I just have a um, I'm just reading in the chat. The, it I'm seems the chat that and um, the interpretation is not working for people. So if if you are, um, you're going to need to select the language that you need to hear. So if you, you need to hear English, uh, then you need to select English. If you need, si, que, si necesitan escuchar español, tienen que seleccionar a español. Um, See, si, como Benjamin, like Ben is saying right now, you have to select if you want full interpretation or only for that language. Um, otherwise, you will have conflicting, you'll have overlapping audio. Um, I suspect that now what's going to happen is now that we'll stop speaking, the panelists will all be in Spanish and the interpretation will be much smoother. I think now because it's reading our platforms differently, there's a little bit of a hiccup, but it should be uh, corrected here shortly. 
Ok. Il euh, y a des gens qui ont demandé s'il si y a des traductions en espagnol, en, anglais, en français, par exemple. Mais on n'en a pas, malheureusement. Euh, ok. Euh, les euh, organisations euh, que nous Presentando, convocando, ya eh, hemos, eh, nos hemos expresado. No sé si eh, Pia quisiera decir algunas palabras para dar paso a los panelistas, a las panelistas. Ramón Márquez Yari, trabajo en la Fundación Ambiente y Recursos Naturales. Eh, y venimos bueno, trabajando y My name is Kim Marquijani. I've been working together with OPSAL and other organizations and grassroots movements in, in terms of the discussion about the problems related to lithium extraction. And we focus a lot on um, environmental rights. And we also want to thank the host today for coordinating this event. Thank you very much. Ramón es muted. Perdón. Vamos a comenzar sí, eh, presentando un pequeño adelanto del documental eh, que preparamos eh, luego ya de dos años de trabajo. Eh, va a ser un breve adelanto. Eh, va a estar muy pronto a, disponible para ver eh, nuestra, nuestra página de YouTube de Fundación Tanti. Y vamos a hacerlo lo, lo más eh, extensivo posible, también eh, con subtítulos en inglés, eh, para que el, el público internacional English, pueda, will eventually have eh, acceder a él. Así que por ahora eh, vamos a compartir moment, este teaser y luego eh, comienza teaser. la primera parte de las presentaciones de we'll los y las eh, panelistas. From our ya estamos a 15. Benjamin, eh, ahí están hablando en el chat que no se está escuchando el audio. Efectivamente, no tenemos audio. ¿No hay audio? No hay audio. Ah, voy, a, voy a ver si funciona ahora. Podríamos empezar. Ah. Una... We don't want this to be a sacrifice zone uh, the way other zones in the area uh, are. We want, you know, this area has uh, given clear signals that uh, it can survive without mining. The situation we're seeing with the uh, mining in the Andean uh, flats um, and the extension of these projects to the Salar of Aricunia and Tapacá in the case of Chile. This is a signal that this um, energy transition is the same development model that led to the crisis that we're experiencing. What, what are we gonna eat where the animals are gonna get water I don't want this to happen because this won't benefit anybody. So to me, my territory is priceless. They come and destroy everything. They say 
uh, you know, that, but this is not, this is not the way things should work. I think this should be about protecting the peoples living in these areas, not protecting the multinational co companies, corporations that come to get our resources. I think with, in time, I think only education uh, will allow people to understand the impacts, not just of lithium extraction, but mining in general, as we can see in the whole territory. So uh, what is the life of an electric car? What's the life cycle? What's the cost? Uh, that's my question. Uh, and this is a question everybody should be asking before uh, working on lithium extraction. Well, so now we're going to start the roundtable, the plurinational roundtable. Um, we're going to have the presentations of uh, contributors to the book and the end of Salt Flats. Uh, my name is Veronica, and I'll be moderating. First, um, we're going to give the floor to Vivian Lagrava. She is part of the uh, Human Rights uh, Collective in Potosí, Bolivia. She's going to talk about OPSAL and her relation, relationship with OPSAL and the challenges uh, related to lithium in Bolivia. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here from Bolivia. Um, I'm the coordinator in my organization. We have three goals. The collective was founded to promote a culture of human rights respect. Um, our priority is to work on uh, raising awareness regarding the importance of water and protecting water, our relationship with OPSAL. Well, we met some of our colleagues uh, from OPSAL during the Latin American uh, Water Summit. This event uh, was organized for the um, Algarrobo Assembly. We met with hundreds of activists from Chile uh, and Bolivia and we had the opportunity. I'm sorry. There's something, some interference. I don't know what's going, what's going on. Vivian, ¿nos escuchas? Hola, ahora sí los escucho. Vivian, can you hear us? Yes, now I can hear you. Okay, we, we can hear you. Yes, I can hear you now. There's a problem. Hola. Hello? Hola. Hola, sí, sí. sí. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you well, Vivian. Bueno. Well, um, as I was saying, um, we've contacted OPSAL um, at the Latin American Summit uh, for Water, and we met with activists from Latin America, Chile, uh, Argentina, and Bolivia. And, uh, and that's how we came together to create uh, an alliance. And these 
alliances uh, have created different processes and one of them has been the work with the OPSAL organization. Then uh, they invited us uh, to an event, the International uh, Seminar on extra Extractivist uh, Economy in the Andes. And we talk about the lithium boom, the consequences and impacts of uh, extractivism. And this was a critical moment for the collective, but also for everybody present at the seminar in Chile, because we uh, learned about specialized investigations on the topic. We met the Council of Atacameño people, and we learned about the hard experiences um, in the Atacama in Chile. And this is something that we really uh, need to learn more about, you know, uh, from Bolivia. When we have the opportunity to create the documentary, you know, this was a pleasure for us because it was an opportunity to um, uh, go to communities close to the uh, Uni Soul Flats. We went to Rio Grande, Vintoka, Coljani, Ujuni. Um, we were not able to get to GP because uh, there's a uh, army presence in the area where the um, industrial plant, lithium plant is. There, um, we met with people that uh, most of them, they don't know the representatives or leaders um, defending the industrialization. Uh, people in the social society, uh, civil societies, you know, they're concerned and they don't really understand why this mega uh, plant was being built, why it was there, and they did not understand why their water resources were drying up. Uh, this is a territory, uh, you know, that's a, almost a desert in some areas. It's very difficult to uh, um, ranch llamas or to uh, grow quinoa in the area. So really the problem is they lack uh, drinkable water, drinking water. So um, this is gonna get a lot worse with lithium extraction. In um, our visits, we saw that people wanted to understand uh, how they could um, they could have the opportunity to oppose these processes. And we made a commitment to go back uh, there and work with them because this was the first time that they were being informed about like self-determination of people and peoples. And uh, the first time they heard about water as a right. That was very interesting uh, to, for us through our experiencing uh, creating the documentary, we proposed an international seminar that we've, um, you know, uh, just to, so that the, it's the university, uh, like in Chile, opens a space uh, for dialogue, but we haven't heard back from the uh, university. But we, you know, we've had the opportunity to work with OPSAL uh, this is something that we should have um, implemented in 2020, but due to the pandemic, uh, we haven't been able to do it. But, you know, yeah, it's a lockdown. Um, but we have the opportunity to uh, continue the dialogue and continue uh, working on this. The challenges that we've seen, uh, we've been, um, we've done some follow-up contact. Some of the leaders have uh, changed and um, the conclusion is that we need to work on research, investigation, because there's a lack of, of information. The uh, reports that uh, from the ministry in Bolivia uh, report wonders. Uh, people focus on industrialization, um, future benefits, but nobody's paying any attention to the salt marshes, all their form, forms of life. The salt flats are an a threatened ecosystem, and that's what they've ignored. And uh, what the communities are not really uh, seeing 
in full. They kind of feel that there's something wrong because they don't have enough water, because the water is drying up. Um, well, uh, we need to um, close up. Yeah, wrap up. Yes, I'm, I'm closing. So in terms of uh, challenges, we want to uh, keep working on work, what we had planned. Uh, the joint uh, investigations research with OPSAL. Uh, we need these alliances to allow for like feedback and e exchange with the communities in the Atacama and the other uh, uh, sister uh, soul flats to empower people. In order to empower people, we need to do this kind of research. Uh, the experience in Potosí uh, regarding resistance and resistance uh, mechanism um, in the face of the transnational companies, we've uh, had it uh, for a long time in like 84 um, with the help of Facundo Gomez, uh, you know, may he rest in peace. We opposed um, uh, um, an American company, uh, you know, that was using the influence and support of the government, you know, uh, same thing with Evo Morales government. Um, and now there's an expectation on the part of the uh, citizenship. Um, you know, they think they're focusing on uh, uh, like uh, tariffs and uh, uh, royalties, but we're really, we want to focus on the environmental crisis that it's, uh, uh, forming and we have um, expectations of working on research, but also on influencing public policy. And I'm sorry, I, I had those interferences. I don't know where they were coming from. Thanks, uh, Vivian. And now um, the floor to Evelyn Vallejos. Uh, she's a, a member of Pucará, which are the Catamarcan peoples uh, for resistance and self-determination. She's also a member uh, in Opsal in Argentina, and she wrote conflicts at the Hombre Muerto Sol Flats in Catamarca, Argentina. Good afternoon. How are you all doing? Thank you for organizing this event. I'm an environmental manager, and we're working with communities at the Hombre Muerto Salt Flat. There are um, groups of Antacameños and other indigenous groups, and their territories have been invaded um, starting 28 years ago by a uh, lithium extraction project. And the effects that this has had are very visible. We can even say that they're irreversible at this point. Um, the, they've been extracting constantly water from the meadows and the effects are devastating. There's been a lot of desertification. Um, there's not enough water as it is. And the contamination around the projects is also very great. But the main problem is the water. There's less and less all the time for local activity for livestock. And we've been providing some assistance in the area of Antofagasta. There's a lot of repression on the part of the government. The reality in Catamarca um, is that um, it's has the most mining activity in the country and the government is corrupt and there's influence of mining companies in every branch of government. So it's very difficult to fight a good fight in these areas. With the current lithium boom and the energy transition. There's been an interest on the part of many, many more countries. There's a company called Galaxy Lithium that has also begun exploiting the resource in the high plains. And there are plans underway for many more projects. 
we are resisting this incursion and we're in contact with other groups in Argentina, Bolivia, Chile as well. And we've been getting a lot of information from professionals working in different organizations. And the resistance movement is growing. So we're going to, we won't give up. We're going to stay in the territory, fighting hand in hand with the communities and the farming communities who are the most affected by this lack of water. So we won't give up and we hope that this process of uh, working together in collaboration with the other countries continues. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Clemente Flores. He's a member of the committee from Salinas Grandes and the Laguna Poyatotoc. And his text is called the History of Our Resistance in, against Lithium and Salinas Grandes in the Laguna of Guayacotoc. Clemente, nos escuchas? Clemente, can you hear us? Hola, ¿me escuchas? Hello. Sí, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Well, my name is Clemente Flores. Muy buenas tardes, mi nombre es Clemente Flores. Good afternoon, my name is Clemente Flores. I live in El Moreno, in the south of the Salinas Grandes, in the province of Jujuy. We've been working now for about 10 years in defending the territory, especially in terms of um, protecting water resources. And we developed a protocol for consultation with local communities. It's called Kachi Yupi. And we presented it to the provincial government and the national government so that it can be put into practice in the territory. And this, our fight continues in the area. Recently with the issue of the pandemic, as you all know, we've been really affected as communities. The communities uh, are trying hard to take care of water in the area and become more self-sufficient now. Um, and it's a struggle. There's not a lot of extra time for resistance. There are some many people who are emigrating. So we need to keep defending the territories. Um, it's our responsibility. Our ancestors, our grandparents have left this task in our hands. And we're very concerned about the lack of interest on the part of the government. They want to sign an agreement to drill in the area. And we haven't been given uh, proper information about this agreement. And so we're very concerned about you know, the stage of negotiations between this company and the government. OPSAL has um, given us a lot of support in this process. And we believe that working together, we can defend the territory and that we can envision a better future. Um, we need to make our presence known. Thank you. Thank you, Clemente. We're hearing from voices straight from the territory. 
Next, we're going to hear from Pia Marchegiani. She's from Argentina. She's a member of the Environment and Natural Resources Foundation. Her text is called uh, In the Time of Lithium, It's Time to Ask the Right Questions. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good. Now I have an opportunity to add to what my colleagues have said. FARN is an environmental organization that is concerned with global warming. But we believe it's very important to ask the right questions so that we can focus on the possible consequences of a move towards lithium. We need to be asking, what is lithium for? What is it useful for? 38% of what is extracted is for automobile batteries. And it seems that there's not enough focus on ren truly renewable energies. And we also need to explore who's benefiting from this sort of development. What we're seeing is that the resources and, and technology are made elsewhere. There are more than 80 companies building batteries. And these are the companies that are adding value to the to the raw materials, but they're located in elsewhere. And we need to ask careful questions about costs as well. Um, I'm not going to talk specifically about the social situation because we have um, other people who are better qualified to speak about those issues. But in terms of environmental impacts, we don't have a necessary information. We don't have the proper or adequate base studies to be able to measure the effects on these very fragile ecosystems. There's another important point. These extractivist tendencies continuously violate environmental rights, and we cannot allow that as a society. As Clemente said on another occasion, do we really have to sacrifice a whole area as a means of preventing global warming? Isn't there a better way to do it? Lithium extraction is devastating communities in the area of the mines. We need to create a new vision as humanity about how to solve these problems. We can't uh, sacrifice one group in order to uh, protect another group. It's important to be very inquisitive and ask the difficult questions. We need to be hearing from all the players and all the affected parties. Typically, when focusing on this green discourse, we're not including the voices of the people who are most affected. Thank you, Pia. In general, we're going to request that those who are presenting do so as a little bit slowly to aid in the process of interpretation. Next, we'll hear from Melissa Argento. She's a 
from the group of studies on common goods. She's from Argentina. She wrote this text with Florencia Puente. They work together in their group um, on the impacts of lithium mining on the soil marshes. Uh, the article is seven hypotheses on territorial dynamics and lithium in Argentina. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, uh, Veronica, and thanks everybody. You know, behind this uh, the organization of this mega event with so many speakers, so many voices being included. I'm part of the um, uh, common good. Uh, policy group. We've been working on uh, issues related to lithium mining. And especially we've worked on this article. We've wrote um, with the article with Florencia Puentes. We've been uh, working on the problems in the territories and the social environmental impacts of lithium mining. In this sense, uh, the truth is, we are so grateful to have been invited uh, to participate in this uh, publication and in our text. We wanted to create a dialogue and suggest some hypotheses for uh, collective uh, thinking, including everybody involved uh, in uh, resisting and defending the territories. I think uh, this is very important because the voices in the struggle, the impacts, uh, you know, the people are suffering, the impacts need to be present, need to be included. And we can see in chapter one, um, I was, uh, you know, very happy to see that chapter one uh, talks about that, the presence and the voices of uh, the people in the front lines. And we really need to learn a lot from them. In this sense, what we are uh, saying is about some trends um, in terms of the impact of lithium mining. And, uh, um, you know, we are kind of playing with the figurative peak, you know, uh, metaphor, thinking about the centrality and the, uh, of the of indigenous communities and the colonization over their territories throughout history and now in the context of lithium uh in the uh, within the context also of uh um, the energy transition so in this sense we um present some hypotheses that we need to think about it uh specifically at this point where we have uh, a combination of a health and social crisis uh, combined with a uh, environmental a crisis that uh, involve transitions but need to be fair transitions um, and many voices are being silenced uh, by the extractive pressures and um, you know things are being called resources when we things that we call uh, common goods when we talk about the soil flats so in this uh, meeting you know i want to say that one of the most difficult things about the uh, pandemic has been now the the, the impossibility to travel because um we well, we were both involved in the wonderful experience of uh, motherhood. Now we have very young uh, children um, in the middle of the pandemic. So at least it's good to have this meeting to be able to uh, meet with everybody in this uh, forum, in this form. So we're very grateful for it. And we want to say that, well, the, these um, activities have allowed us to see, well, lots of uh, webinars, workshops, uh, we've been invited to and we're very grateful for. Um, we've um, uh, met people that, you know, we had met before and shared experiences. And um, 
in terms of our, you know, the relationship with uh, OPSAL, an organization that we support and we follow and disseminate uh, everything they do. Um, this started early in Chile before the observatory was founded as such. I was uh, very important for us to strengthen these networks of organizations and academics and and people who are thinking about these issues. And um, in closing, I wanna say that, um, you know, why is it so important? Why are we so happy about this uh, dialogue and this publication is because sometimes it's very difficult. Sometimes it's just us bringing these issues to um, scientific events where, uh, you know, everything is hegemonic, everything is focused on lithium and its uh, exports and the um, every extractivist industry. And they really silent every demand and uh, struggle on the local communities, on the part of local communities. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. My name is Nicole. I want to ask whether we, you can hear me clearly. Can you? Yes, yes. Well, the next panelist is Ingrid Garces. She's an academic in the Antofagasta University. She also belongs, she's a member of OPSAL, and she is presenting a text on lithium. Uh, the transition Ingrid? scenarios and the Maricunia uh, salt marshes. Ingrid, can you hear us? Can you hear ¿Sí? us? Okay. okay. I am Ingrid Garcés Mías. Uh, even though I worked at the Antofagasta University, I'm here as part of the uh, Plurinational Observatory of uh, Andean uh, Salt Flats. And um, I, it's a pleasure to see um, our idea of, you know, uh, compiling all our interventions uh, realized. Uh, we came up with this idea in the 2019 in three uh, meetings, um, green energies and extractivism. Because of lack of resources, we couldn't finish uh, the book in 2019. But, um, you know, I always think that there's a reason for things. So, I, you know, whatever happened, let us to convene here today. Um, you know, and this goes beyond the three meetings that we had had. There are um, experiences in the three territories. I think we are all represented here in this event. So now I, now I would like to talk about, uh, about you know, the issue that I uh, present. The lithium in the last few years has become one of the basic commodity for uh, technological transition towards uh, transportation and energy uh, productions that are supposed to be alternative. This is supposed to be a strategic resource for the green economy. Uh, but this is from the uh, from the north, from the global north, reflected in international agreements of climate change, um, based on sustainable models and the development of green technologies around the world. So we should be asking ourselves, how can we uh, face uh, in the south this technological revolution? This is water mining. And we need different mechanisms to uh, support this kind of uh, mining. These basins are located in uh, desert uh, areas that are very rich in biodiversity. They have 
uh, unique and fragile ecosystems that um, are being impacted by the extraction, uh, the, by brine extraction. We need to ask, is it worth sacrificing unique ecosystems in the world just for temporary wealth, uh, the temporary wealth that lithium uh, is offering? The impact on the local communities has created, have created deep uh, questioning of the sustainability of the current development model. It's this social environmental conflicts that I present in the article, you know, dialogues about lithium and the uh, possible scenarios in Maricunca uh, salt flats. Chile to incentivize its economy has uh, subsidies. Europe starts a strategy to speed up the decarbonization project, uh, process and the digitalization process. And is, this is seen as the only possible path uh, for economic recovery in the European Union. And in the last few months, this uh, had such an impact that it moved hundreds of civil and academic academic organizations that uh, wrote uh, a letter to the um, European Union Commission so that, so that asking for them to realign their strategies regarding this basic commodity, especially lithium. This idea of realigning means that now we have to involve the interests of the planet of local communities. So this is when we really need to think and, uh, you know, leaving, you know, sacrificing the territories of lithium. Is it worth to do that in order to meet the needs of this uh, so-called green uh, uh, transition? These are some questions that uh, we need to answer in order to build the country that we want to build. And this, these are, uh, you know, um, places, you know, that are Ramsar sites in Chile. And um, in this sense, uh, the article describes the salt marsh, the indigenous communities related to the salt marshes, at the processes, the, the brine extraction processes, the economic importance of this, and the um, unique characteristics of these salt marshes in terms of the uh, possible environmental impacts that uh, we can foresee for the next few years uh, after these two companies start uh, producing in uh, starting in 2021. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Muchas gracias, Ingrid. Thank you very much, Ingrid. Ahora eh, seguimos con el now, siguiente invitado. Our next uh, guest eh, speaker Spindola. is uh, Christian eh, Spindola. Christian Spindola. Eh, is Tocunao a member of the Tokonao Atacameña community and the eh, um, Association of Agriculturists eh, of Songo. His article de la is the testimony of my experience eh, in Tokonao and mining in our territories. Uh, Christian, can you hear us? Yes. Yes, Nicole, good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. First of all, thank you for inviting me um, to this important event. I want to um, uh, congratulate everybody who participated in this uh, work. Um, um, it's been a pleasure to be invited. Um, and thanks Ramon, who's been a very critical um, uh, presence in this work. Regarding what you were saying, um, well, yes, uh, indeed in Tokonao, uh, we have two mining companies um, in the Atacama salt marsh. These are the, two, the you know, the two companies that are uh, now in our territory. These companies 
uh, came and life really changed for many people. For some, for the better, for some, for the worse. So I'm gonna talk about the worst, um, you know, and talk about uh, the presence of this uh, mining company in Toconao. We're a farming uh, community. Uh, we have farming, we have crafts, we have a culture, and this company uh, has been invasive and they've been negotiating with our with science, with our history, our values, and um, as every mining company, they bring a discourse of good neighborliness. Um, and, you know, the the first thing that happens in the in, to, in Tokonao is the division of uh, people, of the population. This is, uh, uh, you know, they are causing a terrible negative impact in Atacama. Um, this company in our territory has divided uh, people in a very significant way. And it's also uh, dividing uh, agriculturists like farmers in uh, Toconao because of uh, water use issues. Um, so now, in a way, uh, they want to, you know, change the way of uh, practicing agriculture. They're extracting uh, way more water than we would normally extract. And this is really creating huge divisions uh, in our population. So, you know, in the end, we're just numbers. We're just figures for these mining companies. There's uh, no respect for our Asian culture at Likanantai. Um, in the article, what I'm speaking about is focused on this, and really, it's a major concern for us, not just in our area, but throughout the country, mining companies offer money, but nothing comes for free. It's a major extraction of water, and it's a desert. I'm hearing the same thing from my brothers from Argentina and brothers from Bolivia, brothers and sisters. It's been in their, their territories where it's a constant process of improvisation. And what's happening in Argentina and Bolivia is also of great concern. But that's why I'm here. We need to fully understand these costs and speak about them. My brothers and sisters from Argentina and Bolivia and in Chile as well, we cannot give up. We need to stick to the fight because we're seeing now examples even in the United States of, of water becoming a commodity. And uh, it's almost like a kind of macabre interest on the part of mining companies. Um, these mining companies are some of the most corrupt in, in all of Chile. But we're going to stay in the fight. And the communities are meeting and talking about this issue. So I'd like to thank you and encourage you all the, to not give up. Thank Muchas Christian. Thank you, Christian. And the next presentation is by Jorge Muñoz Coca. He's also a member of the Observatory of Indian Salt Plats. Esto es, se denomina Testimonio de mi retorno al campo y la lucha por la defensa del salar de Atacama. 
about the eh, Jorge, struggle to defend the Atacama Salt Flats. Okay. Jorge, can you cure us? Perfecto. Yes, perfectly. La palabra, so I give the floor to you. Well, thank you. First of all, I want to thank everyone present here today, this afternoon. This is such an important event for our observatory. The observatory was born here in Atacama, born out of the initial complex around this issue. And Currently, the observatory includes many members in all three countries. So we've gone from seeing the conflict as a sudden sort of conflict with starting in 2016. We realized that there was a negotiation process that was well underway at that point, and we hadn't been consulted. And they were close to signing agreements. And as a president of my indigenous community, I represent the community of Socor. Currently, I'm the president of the community. And we had to very quickly organize ourselves and sit down at the table with leaders from the company. And we needed to seek help from other entities and get support from the outside. So this observatory was born out of this need a means of understanding the conflict with the mining industry. So we began to communicate, especially with um, young people, and speak about the effects of mining on communities. As time went by, we were able to get more concrete results. First, it was a loose collective called Chanyar. And then later, after about five years of working, we've become more visible, a louder voice, so to say. So to say. Sometimes communication is um, difficult, or traditionally has been difficult because we live in remote areas, but with uh, digital, in the digital age, we're able to connect more together and communicate better. We had a negative experience in Chile. There are already companies operating and extracting in our salt flats. And for our vision, we felt that we had this idea that the salt flats were all united. And we see everything that we have in common. We have our culture in common. We have our need for water in common. And we have uh, ancestral traditions that we share. And in in this case, we were actually able to begin to erase the borders between us and the area. Um, I consider myself a social farmer planting seeds through my conversations. And these seeds have um, borne fruit and now they're being nourished in the form of this book. And we're sharing these seeds uh, far and wide now. So I. Thank you so much for all of uh, your participation. I send you all a big hug.
Muchas gracias, Jorge. Thank you very eh, much, Jorge, por, por tu trabajo. For your words and for your work. Eh, nuestra siguiente invitada, Our panelista, next guest. Eh, es Elena Rivera, Cardoso. Elena Rivera Cardoso. Ella también pertenece al Observatorio de la Comunidad Internacional de la Comunidad Indígena. Ella es presidenta de la Comunidad de Coya Indígena. Ella um, eh, denomina Comunidad Indígena Coya eh, uh, como una de Copiapó. Coya eh, Elena, uh, Indígena Community en Copiapó. Elena, ¿puedes escucharnos? Elena, Elena, puedes activar el el audio. Can you unmute yourself? Eh, vamos a solucionar esto mientras. Um, we have to uh, solve this problem. Elena, ¿no se escucha? Hi, can you hear us? Sí. Yes. Puedes. Eh, can you. Puedes activar tu cámara. Uh, turn on your video. Bueno, pero tenemos el audio no. de todas formas. Well, at, at least we have your audio, so you can start. ¿Me escucha ahora? Can you hear me now? Yes. Sí, te escuchamos bien. Yes, we can hear you well. Sutil Elena Rivera Cardoso, Ocacoyo de Acamanca, Chispi, Curisnapa, Conquinagua. Hi, my name is Elena Cardoso. I'm a bit of the Coya people. I'm very grateful to have been invited this afternoon to this event with you. Uh, first of all, I want to say that my community is like 40 or 50 minutes away from the Maricunia uh, salt marsh. We are being invaded by two mining companies uh, that have been uh, approved already uh, to operate in the salt marsh. Odelco is another company, um, also has been approved uh, the uh, you know, the exploration claim has been approved, uh, granted, because they are also uh, planning on uh, extracting in this salt marsh. Um, for us, this is uh, hugely important because the damage that can be done to the salt flat and our culture, the salt flat is part of our cosmovision and we know, but with, without water and without land, there's no culture and the damages uh, done through this extraction, um, you know, the extraction that is gonna happen in our territory in salt marsh is a genocide, uh, you know, of the genocide of our people, of our culture. And this is, you know, uh, being done in the Cordillera. We need the water from this um, area. We uh, feed on the animals that graze around the salt marshes. Um, we see how Chile is allowing for uh, the destruction of our ancestral territory, uh, the territory of uh, native peoples, and in this case, our people. So this is the main concern we have uh, right now because we're seeing how all this biodiversity is being destroyed and uh, you know everything we have in this territory, in this sector. As we um, were saying, you know, talking with uh, Ramon and other people, everything is so that an electric car that we don't know how long it's gonna last, uh, we don't know how much they are going to, going to extract, extract for just one single car, you know, per car. And all this is just, uh, you know, to the detriment and at the expense of uh, an ancient uh, culture that is very sensitive and very dependent on um, the biodiversity of the marshes. And we've 
always seen uh, how other companies are uh, causing destruction, but uh, this is like our time to start like raising our voices and we thank Opsal for being there, for giving us this opportunity, um, you know, to give a voice to us in the Maricunia salt marshes because we don't want to have the same thing uh, that happened in the Atacama to happen here. Right now, our salt marshes are still beautiful, but we don't want to see the same thing happening. This, the same thing that happened in Atacama happened here. Their water resources are drying up and all the uh, uh, surrounding communities are being deeply affected. Um, not um, in, in, you know, there's not like enough awareness of the damage as, and the death that this extractive activity can cause. So this is the main concern that we have and we want to struggle as a community, as a Koya people in our territory. We're saying no to lithium extraction because of all the terrible impacts this could have for us and for the citizenship at large. This is this goes way beyond just us. So, I mean, I don't know what else I could say regarding our territory and the salt marshes um, that, you know, have hasn't been said uh, yet. I think we need to uh, we need to work hard and uh, call no, not just you, but a citizenship in general, you know, why uh, modernity has to happen at the expense of Asian uh, communities. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Muchas gracias, Elena. Thank you very much, Elena. Thank you for your words. Luego, los siguientes participantes the eh, following speakers Quebec. are joining eh, from uh, Quebec. Nos, eh, nos van a acompañar And, Mark Lantel, um, representante de uh, Reino, they're, de Canadá. They're gonna, uh, y también Rodrigo eh, Cuyón, eh, representante uh, del Comité representative eh, of de la Protección de uh, Committee, CCP, uh, to protect uh, eh, CCP. Eh, presentarán, eh, o sea, harán una presentación en And conjunto, pero eh, cada cual de sus organizaciones. But eh, each of them represents their eh, own uh, organization. Can you hear us? Hola. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I will begin uh, the presentation and for five minutes, and then after it will be uh, my colleague Mark uh, will take the lead. Um, I'm gonna just uh, share my screen to present you um, uh, the um, uh, just one moment where we are located. Okay. Yeah. So. No problem. Oh, okay. Um, uh, just one minute. Okay. Oh, it won't work. Um, I, I'm not sure. Maybe. Kirsten, are you able to share the uh, presentation? Uh, it's okay um, if it's not at this very moment, because uh, I will need to to quit uh, Zoom uh, if I want to to share my screen. So uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, okay, so I, I'll, I'll start the presentation. Yeah, Rodrigue, just give me one second. I just have to pass it to my computer, to the other oh. computer, and I will share. Right, so okay. you can start. Okay. I'll just follow your, your script. Uh-huh. Okay, yeah, perfect. Okay. okay, so Koe, bonjour, hello, hola. My name is uh, Rodrigue Surgeon, and as uh, I was presented, I'm the co-sports person for of the uh, Comité Citoyen de Protection de a French translation for uh, Citizen Committee for the Protection of the Esker. And Esker is a unique geological uh, formation that provides one of the purest uh, drinkable water in the world. Um, I'm also a member of the Regroupement Vigilance Mine Abitibi Timiskaming, Mining Vigilance Group of Abitibi Timiskaming, that my colleague Marc Nantel is about to present you, and of the uh, Coalition Québec Meilleur Mine, the Quebec branch of Mining, Can uh, Mining Watch Canada. Um, 
so on February 1st, uh, 2018, our committee discovered that, the, uh, that an Australian mining company, Sayona Mining, wanted to exploit a lithium deposit uh, less than 500 meters from the SK Samatubegi. This project is named OT Lithium. Um, and I'm not sure if you, you'll see it at the moment, but you, you'll find this, um, this project. Uh, it's the left star, left star on your screen that we, you will see. Um, it is located in Northern Quebec in a town named Lamotte. The news, uh, after we discovered the proximity uh, between the, the project, the mining project and the ESCA, the news instantly sparked outrage uh, among the Abitibi population. Five months later, a map of the company released uh, show, showed that the nearest um, uh, proposed facility were barely 20 meters from the ESCA. Um, already alongside the SCAR, nothing uh, legally prevents the company from directly encroaching on it since uh, the company owns numerous, numerous claims on the SCAR. Yeah, thank you for the, uh, the share a screen. So the impression that Sayona Mining is trying to cover up sensitive information has persisted, persisted sorry, since the public learned that the mining company deliberately designed design its plan to avoid being submitted to the environmental public hearings. So it's the BAP, uh, the acronym in French. In fact, by claiming to extract only 1,900 metric ton per day, TPD, um, Sayana Mining legally wished to uh, fall just below the 2,000 tons of ore extracted per day, the threshold which entails uh, the automatic application of the rigorous environmental impact assessment proce procedure. So uh, a vast citizen mobilization uh, was therefore formed uh, with the main objective of proving to the Quebec uh, Minister of Environment the lack of social acceptability of the project and the need to submit it to the BAP the public hearings. The Citizen Committee for the Protection of the ESCAR was born out of this movement. Three scientific organizations uh, whom analyzed the uh, first environmental study of the OT lithium project conclude, uh, concluded that it was light, lacking in rigor, shows uh, a lack of crucial information and was clearly written with an unwarranted sense of urgency. At the same time, the ambitions of Sayona mining in the territory of uh, Lamotte, the village, caused a democratic and political crisis in the village. Since its revelation to the public in uh, early February uh, 2018, so about three years ago, Sayona mining has not only ignored the population desire, desire sorry, that the OT uh, project uh, lithium would be submitted to the BAP, uh, but the company also broke several uh, of its uh, public commitments. Then after we have filed a request of, for information to the Ministry of Environment in order to obtain every document that of the mining company concerning the project. Almost two months later, we discovered by uh, analyzing confidential documents that the actual plan of Sayana Mining was ex exceeding by more than uh, 100 TPD, the threshold of 2000 TPD in the seventh year plan. From then on, um, the question of whether or not to submit the OT project lithium to uh, the BAP on a discretionary basis was irrelevant. In fact, our committee was of the opinion that the OT uh, lithium project should be subject to the BAP in an automatic and non-discretionary manner. Uh, we then sent to the minister a formal notice giving him 10 days to submit the project to the BAP, the public hearings. Mighty failed to act before the extension of the delay. We intended to launch an action before the judicial court. But eight days later, the minister followed our warning and announced that he was going to submit the OT project 
uh, to the rigorous environmental impact assessment procedure before the BAP. It was a huge victory for us uh, that was celebrated throughout the, our region, especially in Amos, um, uh, the, the biggest town around. Uh, a few days later, where uh, 250 people demonstrated in the streets of the city for the protection of the Esker. So uh, we can show the second slide. And uh, a few weeks after the minister resounding Assam announcement, Sayana Mining responded by reveal, revealing its uh, intention to significantly, sorry, change its plan. Yeah, because in fact, the volume of ore extracted per day suddenly increased to 2,600 TPD, uh, an increase uh, of about 30%. Um, the mining company therefore uh, had to go back to his homework to finally present uh, uh, last year its third version uh, of its environmental assessment. It recently underwent a pre preliminary assessment by 33 uh, government entities, which uh, with the majority um, uh, conclude that it was inadmissible uh, for the moment for several environmental, social, and economic reasons. At this rate, and considering the delay caused uh, by the COVID-19 crisis, we do not expect the BAP hearings uh, to be held before the end of 2021 uh, winter, so February and March. So uh, thanks a lot, and uh, I will pass the, the mic to um, my colleague, Mark. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry because I've just got in. Uh, so uh, my name is Mark Nantel and I'm the spokesperson for Revimap. Our mission is to help the citizens of our vast region to defend themselves against the negative impacts of mining and uh, we campaign to protect the environment. Uh, the presentation I'll do is is how a mining project can go wrong. Uh, it's a project, a, a lithium project that started in 2012. Its name is Quebec Lithium. And uh, the citizens didn't uh, uh, mo mobilize because it went under the radar. Uh, it's uh, located a few meters south of a sensitive aquifer named Arikana Moren. Uh, the drinking water of this aquifer has a very high quality. The studies of the impacts on the environment of this project were botched by the various government departments. The federal environment assessment process of this project was not completed. The project was able to begin its operation without having to go through the investigation process of the Office of Public Hearings on the Environment of Quebec. Since the beginning of this exploitation, two company mines uh, didn't have the money, the financial means to exploit the mine, and they went bankrupt. And there's a third company, that's Sayona Mining, that's trying now to buy it. The underfunding of these projects results in a glaring lack of environment security measures. Uh, I'll cite only one accident. In March 2018, an accidental spill of 50,000 cubic meters of water of end quartz was produced following a break off a dam. The consequences of the environmental emergency on humans and on the environment are important and difficult to identify. It's impossible to measure the impact on the groundwater and on the surface water. The company comes out with a slap on the wrist. And now let's see another way the company started the, the project and the, the the, the citizens didn't you know, get very uh, uh, mobilized because they didn't get the information. In 2012, the configuration of the open pit retained 
is very different from that the one used in the feasibility study in the initial hydrogeological study in 2010. It is more extensive in each of the three dimensions and its total operating tonnage is 45.2% higher. You can see on the picture that you have on the left, the project that was talked about and studied and the real project was on the right. In summary, the hydrogeological impact studies were not carried out on the real project. Here are a few shortcomings of this project identified by the Society of Underground Water of Abitibi Timiskaming mm -hmm. that are due to the increase of the volume of the open pit. One, an increase of volume will have an impact on the water of the aquifer of the Arikana Morin. Two, the growth of the groundwater drawdown zone will be larger. Three, the increased drainage will have an impact on the storage of the infrastructure, on the flow of the water, and on the treatment process of the water. We have no clue regarding the impact on the groundwater on the surface water of this project. The whole ecosystem surrounding the project is at risk. So you can see that this project, the problem is we want to do an exploitation rapidly. We want to go on the, uh, on the uh, make money with lithium and we contour all the laws and the reglements and we get finally a very, very dangerous pro uh, uh, project. That's it. Muchísimas gracias, Mark, eh, por la presentación. Eh, gracias, Mark, por esta presentación. Ahora tenemos unos últimos invitados que son panelistas. We have an, a guest who's joining us from Serbia. So, Maria, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hello, everyone. My name is Maria Alimpic, and I'm from Serbia from the organization Protect Yadra and Rajevina. I will share my screen so you so that I can, um, just a minute. Um, okay, can you see it? Yes. Okay. Uh, I guess that most of you may not have heard of Serbia. So to begin with, Serbia is a country in um, Southeast Europe. You can see it here on the map. Uh, it is situated in Balkan Peninsula and in the region that spreads between two municipalities in West Serbia, between Loznitz and Krupanj, that are about 150 kilometers southwest from the capital of Serbia, Belgrade. International company Rio Tinto wants to open a lithium mine. Um, here you can see a geological um, survey of Serbia. And here in this west part is planned lithium borates mine project area location. As you can see, it's very close to Bosnia and Herzegovina and River Drina, which is international river. So you already guessed that this problem won't affect only our country. I will try to give you a brief introduction what has been going on in past 17 years in Serbia. Rio Tinto has been exploring in the area since 2003. In 2017, a memorandum of understanding uh, between the government and the company was signed, but it has never been disclosed to public, even though we have asked for it several times. 
spatial plane of the area that you can see in this picture uh, has been uh, prepared by the Ministry of Construction, Transport and Infrastructure in 2019. The problem with this spatial plan is that the time for public comments has been uh, only 30 days from 25th of November to 24th of December in 2019. I must add here that the company has not uh, finished the project yet. Feasibility study has not been done. Uh, ecological studies have not been done. So basically the government of Serbia has approved a spatial plan for the project. We have no idea how it might look eventually. In October 2020, the municipality of uh, Loznica voted in the public um, investment to change the route of Valjevo Loznica Road, which would eventually serve only to the mining area, even though uh, they, they knew it will um, make severe damage to people who live there. Um, on these two pictures, you can see all of uh, the river Yadar. This is planned uh, mining and industrial zone. And as you can see on these photos, we speak about um, agricultural land, very fertile, fertile agricultural land. And I must add here that in the territory of municipality of Loznica, around 19,000 people depend on agriculture. Uh, in the area, we have two important rivers, Korenita and Yadar. They are important because they are tributaries of Drina, which flows then into Sava and then into Danube, another international river that will be affected by this project if it ever happens. Here, um, you can see one of the villages that will be center of um, filtered tailing zone. This one is called Gornje Brezovice. And of course, as you can see in these beautiful pictures, um, people live thanks to agriculture here, here too. Uh, it is important to mention that, that 200 hectares of forest area would be permanently um, uh, destroyed for the purposes of the tailing zone. Um, what is also important is to mention that uh, uh, in the process of being recognized as uh, the, the mountain you can see in these pictures is called Tsar as, and is in the process of being recognized as outstanding landscape by the Institute for Nature Conservation of Serbia. Uh, and it is also an important bird area and it is located only three kilometers north from the planned mine and processing area. Uh, as everyone else before me mentioned cultural heritage, we must add that uh, this area is very rich when it comes to cultural and historical heritage. Uh, here you can see outstanding landscape, cultural uh, landscape Trushić and Tronosha, a historical heritage and natural val value. One thousand ten hectares of the landscape are in the spatial plan for the mine. Uh, Tronosha is a monastery that was built in 14th century. And the both of these areas, Trešić and Tronosha, are actually an open space museums. It's in this area, there are 145 protected species of plants and animals, of which 62 are strictly, strictly protected. Um, here you can see St. George Church, which is located only 100 meters from the potential plant processing zone. Um, it is in the village Gornje Nedeljica and it is the second oldest church in, this, in West Serbia, in this area. On the right side, uh, you, see a you can see a memorial from the Second World War in the place Draginac, which is only two and a half kilometers from the mining impact zone. Uh, this place is very important for uh, Serbian history and for all Serbs because during the Second World War, uh, almost 3,000 Serbs were shot by German soldiers in one day. There are a lot of other archeological um, important locations such as Paulian Necropolis, uh, which is within the planned mine zone. 
and we must add here that Rio Tinto has funded the recent round archaeological excavations. Uh, one of the reasons for that might be that that is there, um, let's say, a reserve tailing waste location. Uh, there have been uh, done a lot of uh, different damages so far, um, such as groundwater problems during exploration, uh, spills from drill hole and groundwater contamination in Nedelice, problems with the water from the church fountain at Nedelice, which you can see at the right, uh, in the right picture. On the left, you can see that uh, whatever they did, explore, exploration and research, nothing grows anymore. <clears throat> the door you can see are the door of their office in that village where we left this contaminated water so they can taste what they have done so far. Our organization together with the Coalition for Sustainable Mining in Serbia has done a lot of activities such as protests, um, uh, which you can see in the pictures above that uh, was held in front of the uh, Rio Tinto offices in Breziak. And on the picture left, you can see one of the assemblies at Nedelice in front of the church we saw previously. And the reason for that assembly, like for many others, was mine and the opposition of, of all people who, who don't want it. Uh, with our activities, we try to to send the message that lithium is not sustainable, that water is worth more than lithium, that agriculture and everything else that people produce in this uh, part of Serbia is worth way more than, than lithium. Um, in these pictures, you can, you can see that this part, this part of Serbia has already had a lot of problems. Uh, there were devastating floods in Balkans in May 2014, and they're also flooding the Valley of Yadar. The most costly disaster of the floods on the territory of Serbia was caused by the failure of the tailings pond at the closed antimony mine in Korenita. High levels of heavy metals were detected in the river Korenita, Yadar, and Drina, and after partial repairs and further failures, it took the government two years to start the full remediation of the site, which was completed in fall 2016. So we, hope we have already, we, we know what can happen if, uh, if we have a mine. And I need to add that um, all those problems we had before from the previous mines are probably nothing what may happen if Rio Tinto or any other company would start exploiting and extracting lithium here. There is also another mine. Uh, like 10 kilometers from Loznica in Zayacha. And you can see in this picture how it looks like when the government finishes remediation. Uh, the pollution from the smelter has been increasingly impacting the local population since 2006, but the complaints of the local population were not listened to. After the, company, uh, after the company bankrupted in 2015, the landfill was remediated with public money you know, during the period from 2016 to 2018. And we must add that not much has been done. Um, Maria, estamos a un minuto del cierre. Um, Maria, uh, you have only one minute. OK. Uh, yeah, OK. Um, we, uh, the entire population of Serbia, the majority of is opposing to this mine and we will try everything to, to prevent mine from opening. As the government says, this is the business of the century. We say no and that honey and other agricultural products are the business of the century. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Gracias. Hvala. Muchísimas gracias, María. Thank you very much, María. Thank you. Uh, we also want to take the opportunity to thank the participation of all panelists, all the presentations. We are extremely grateful that you've uh, joined us today. And now um, I'm going to, well, Ramón Morales is going to take the floor um, in closing. Ramón, can you hear me?
Sí. Yes. Bueno, muchas gracias well, a todos y todas por la participación, las presentaciones. Eh, nosotros había, habíamos previsto eh, un tiempo de duración de hasta dos horas del evento y eh, yo quería proponer, And, um, que no sé si les parece, si damos de repente espacio para un par de preguntas, uh, ya que eh, todavía tenemos unos minutos. No sé si, eh, si les parece, si um, les parece. If you think that's y, a good idea. Y en, entonces, And, um, eh, me ofrezco a, a so, leer las preguntas. You know, I can actually eh, read la, la idea the es que the no si las panelistas cierto, tengan is, uh, la, la oportunidad y los asistentes to, de I mean, dialogar. I don't know if entonces, Irme a you know, las, for dialogue, but let's see, I'm going to read chat. some of the questions from eh, the chat. Hay un eh, a, anónimo, a, uh, an anonymous dice, comment uh, saying, well, andinos, congratulations on protecting únicos, the uh, Andean uh, soft flats, which are unique ecosystems. How can, uh, how can we raise awareness that, uh, that uh, this activity is not a clean a source of energy uh, to eh, promote uh, a clean transition. Eh, entonces, la, la pregunta frente, so a, frente al contexto y, y la complejidad que, que nos presenta la, la situación y el panorama, eh, ¿cómo enfrentamos, o sea, cómo, cómo creamos conciencia? You know, Ahí hay una pregunta. También preguntan si existen métodos alternativos para acumular is, energía prescindiendo del energy, y, uh, without using pero, Se pregunta también si se han intentado And acciones internacionales ante organismos de derechos humanos actions, por estas violaciones um, de derechos. With international eh, so, bueno, human rights. Uh, uh, y preguntas ya pueden bodies. ser suficientes well, para, para comentarios. Enough, uh, eh, entendiendo también uh, que start, uh, eh, el grupo es bastante heterogéneo. Eh, la, la riqueza uh, de este colectivo y de este espacio, pero también es un desafío. Eso lo, lo sabemos, y somos conscientes. Uh, Entonces, eh, frente a esos tres, so, eh, a esos tres eh, comentarios, preguntas. You know, Thinking about these three eh, comments, questions. Yo quisiera abrir la palabra. Like to, no sé si le parece uh, a las compañeras. Eh, Verónica o Nicole, si I quieren know, más o menos ver ahí el, el tiempo de las intervenciones. To, um, y si de entre los y las panelistas alguien quisiera hacer un comentario respecto a estas preguntas, yo like cedo la palabra entonces. Si alguien quiere hacer un comentario o responder a estas preguntas, puedo darle el mic. El audio, Ingrid. Tiene que activar el micrófono. Ingrid, quería comentar. Ingrid, would you like to begin? Pero puedo hacer un alcance. Ok, sí, perdón, pensé que te había visto que la palabra. Perdón. No, no. Pero quería como que cambiar en el modelo de desarrollo. Porque I'd like to say that we need to change uh, the development model because there isn't a better solution currently. And we need to change our lifestyles. We can't keep consuming in, in the way that we have been. This lifestyle that we're living is the wrong lifestyle. For young people today, it's difficult, I think, but they have to make the effort. They have to change their lifestyle because this affects all natural resources, not just lithium, all natural resources. The observation that I want to make is that the lithium industry and in general, the mining industry
claims to offer growth and development, but that's a lie. These plants don't actually provide large, many sources of employment. I think in this context, it's important to mention it. It hasn't been mentioned yet today because these projects are sold to countries and the population as job generation projects. And it's not true. I'm not, in general, I'm not against mining. I'm an engineer, but the way these projects are carried out is not right. And in terms of the question, can we focus on economic development? Yes, but we need to focus on value added projects not just exportation of raw materials. And there's a huge deficit, a global deficit. In terms of the difference between the extraction process and the production process. I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. Ramon? Dale, Christian. Go ahead, Christian. Thank you. There's a question, I think, by Federico, our brother, who was asking about uh, the conflict between those who are against the mine and the Atacameños who are actually working in, for the company. And it's an interesting question. It's true that we all need to work somehow. We need to work. And this conflict has. Yeah, we're li we're listening, Christian. We can hear you. Efectivamente, lo que pasa es que este este tema esta minera. Si nosotros nos ponemos a analizar, no no efectivamente entre. So if we really analyze the process, uh, the mining companies in general, they're not creating a lot of jobs, but there's a perception that uh, they are, but in reality, the jobs that they offer are really, um, to put it bluntly, are brute jobs. There aren't doors open to uh, management positions in these mining companies. You don't see indigenous people acting as a superintendent or in on planning committees of the company. The mining companies hire local people um, for digging wells, but they would never even consider hiring an indigenous person in a decision-making capacity. And what has this generated? Well, this has um, created a, an, um, an uprooting of the culture and the people and, um, in terms of their connection with the earth because the mining company doesn't provide good salaries and so we've seen a process also of um, people abandoning their ancestral lands um, because of economic need. So in terms of Federico's question, mining activities have uh, created a sort of uprooting of the local population. And the mining company was uh, 
didn't act um, in good conscience during this pandemic period uh, where people were obligated to go to work despite the pandemic and there were actually deaths of people who um, were infected with COVID. So their form of acting as a citizen is not proper, it's not. Sí, um, gracias, eh, Cristian. Eh, hay hay unas eh, preguntas también que tú la conectaste por ahí, Cristian, sobre eh, la situación del COVID en el proceso extractivo de las mineras. Yo, si me permiten, a, a agregar un comentario, diría que, que están muy atentos y atentas porque se está ofreciendo, eh, se está hablando de la minería como eh, una, una forma de reactivar la economía eh, luego de esta pandemia y del, de la recesión económica que ha significado que se tenemos en este momento que un escenario doblemente complejo porque el extractivismo um, que ya estaba pasado de verde y la hegemonía que iba a, a permitir, eh, digamos, descarbonizar el planeta ahora también está pensado para reactivar la economía. Entonces, el escenario se pone más complejo, pero esta contradicción es más evidente en el extractivismo verde. Uh, Yo no now, sé si uh, quisieran eh, comentar algo de eh, Argentina o si están clemente, eh, quisieran relatarnos cómo vivieron la, la situación de la pandemia, porque quienes estamos en el UPSAL eh, mantuvimos like siempre la comunicación y de hecho fue durante la propia pandemia que, eh, que surge, digamos, la decisión de ir adelante con este libro, de ir adelante con el documental que teníamos pendiente por terminar, pero sabíamos que al mismo tiempo eh, la situación en los territorios estaba bastante compleja y sabemos que que en Jui, particularmente, o acá en Ciudad de la Tacaba, esta situación no fue la, la excepción. También Elena nos hablaba de que lo, la, la resolución de calificación ambiental de los proyectos de Slar de Maricunga fueron entregados durante la pandemia, cuando las comunidades tenían... Entonces, eh, bueno, me permití esos comentarios y te cedo la palabra para comentar esa pregunta. Ramón, yes, there were some cases of fatalities. One of the mining companies was trying to um, cover up some of the measures that they were taking. It affected several different communities. Initially, they didn't have COVID in the community, but um, those who were working in the in the mines on breaks would go back to their community, and so it was spreading because of that. It's a, it's important to take measures to protect ourselves in this pandemic. So the virus, virus did reach some of our communities. I wanted to add a little bit to what we were talking about before, about the actions that we can take in, as three countries. APSA uh, has been fundamental in terms of allowing uh, or providing a stage for people to express their, themselves. What we discovered is that it's also very important to um, have access to information and to be able to see documents and share documents. And I uh, would like to work um, more closely with some of the other representatives that we are present here today. Thank you, Clemente. So I think at this point we can 
conclude our round table and we want to thank Opsa for the space and thank all of the presenters today. This coming year is it's going to be very important during this coming year to uh, strengthen these ties that we've um, initiated here and listen to each other's voices more and to coordinate our actions in order to keep focusing on the excessive consumption is the root of these problems. And that should really be our focus. Nicole, do you have something to add? I agree completely. I just want to say that this idea of uniting our voices is very important. And we need to reach out and create new contacts with others as well. I think sharing this space has uh, created a sense of unity for all of us um, and uh, the idea that we, it's a territory that we share and that belongs to all of us. And I want to thank each of the panelists for their participation and thank you for joining us from Canada and from Serbia. You added a lot to this event. So at this point, uh, I would just invite you all to read the book. Soon you're going to be able to see an online version of it. And then it will be published as well. The book, along with the documentary, uh, hopefully will reach many people and we will stay in touch with you and we thank you all for your participation and send you all a hug and <laughs> good afternoon. Ciao, ciao. Ciao. Thank you, thank you. You can put your contact information in the chat also ciao, ciao. if you like. Bye bye.